Are we living in a post-fact society? Sometimes it seems like we're never going to agree, not only on all the problems that we face in this world, but even on whether they exist. Think about all those arguments over climate change and crime statistics. I think this inability to establish facts stems from the divisiveness of social media, which, whether we like it or not, has become the most important forum we have for public debate and has changed mass media forever. The constant trolling, those endless online arguments, they impede our ability to reach consensus. And without consensus, society can't co-create knowledge. I say co-create because knowledge has always been the outcome of a communal process, of dialogue and constructive debate. But it requires an openness to new ideas, a willingness to consider opinions that are different from our own. Knowledge needs empathy and humanism. And I guess that's what's bothering me most about this current moment. I feel as if we are on the verge of losing our humanism. And if that's the case, we just allow those in power to dictate what the facts are. I'm reminded of my time living and working as a journalist in Argentina, and this guy, the late Nestor Kirchner, was in power. He wasn't happy because the National Statistics Agency, INDEC, was reporting rapidly rising inflation. So he took swift, decisive action. He sacked the senior staff, the echelon, upper echelons of INDEC, and installed a team of loyalists to write in lower numbers. Voila, inflation problem solved. Now, of course, anybody walking into a supermarket could tell that prices were continuing to rise. Private economists were estimating that inflation was running at 25% but INDEC kept insisting that it was 8%. And this made me uncomfortable as a journalist, because every time I reported the government's facts or, or numbers, I felt like I was complicit in the propagation of these lies. My headlines on Dow Jones Newswires came out looking like this. But for all I cared, I might as well have just said this. <laughs> now, Nestor Kirchner, is not the first nor the last leader to disseminate dubious information. American journalists are grappling with a very similar problem right now. But Argentina's experience provides a stern warning of what's at stake. Kirchner's wanton disregard for the truth destroyed all confidence in the Argentine economy, so much so that inflation got worse. Now, 10 years later, a new government is confronting rates as high as 45%. It's a stark reminder of the lasting damage that gets done to society when governments abandon empirical sources of information and instead peddle in alternative facts. But what is a fact in the social media era? In the old era, mainstream media played a kind of filtering role, right? It would dictate and determine the narrow range of ideas that were acceptable for public discourse and knowledge creation. So if you were an extreme right-wing white supremacist, for example, or maybe an extreme left-wing Marxist revolutionary, your views typically didn't get heard. Now, no one's in charge. Everyone has a voice. Anyone can claim that anything is news. And anyone can claim that anything they disagree with is fake news. So now it's up to us, the general public, and not mainstream media, to decide what to believe and who to trust. Now, I think this new, chaotic online society, what it needs is for its culture to evolve. Offline, civilization had millennia with which to develop its norms and mores when to say please and thank you, when to speak, when to listen, which words are appropriate and which ones are so offensive that they kill all prospect of constructive dialogue. If we want this new society to move forward in the 21st century, I think we need a similar process of evolution to occur, albeit more rapidly, within this new online society and culture. 
But if we can do that, if we can build positive feedback loops of open-mindedness and respect, I think that social media can be a powerful force for freedom of thought, innovation, and prosperity. Well, how do we get there? Well, the answers may lie in the fields of digital currencies and blockchain technology, which is the field I happen to work in now. There, the research focuses on how we might use software algorithms and incentives to guide communities toward consensus. And the hope is that with that, maybe one day we'll create some sort of algorithmic system where social media is fairer, more democratic, and more open. But let's face it, no single technology alone can build a better society. This is a human problem. It's up to you and me to fix this. So where do we start? Well, one of the right things to think about, starting off, is you know, how much this new system of mass communication is fundamentally different from the previous one. In fact, I would say that social media is the most disruptive change in our system of sharing information since Gutenberg's Bible. Just think about what the previous industry system was. When, when uh, traditional news organizations would dis distribute information, they would use physical infrastructure, printing presses, TVs, radio stations, cables, satellite dishes, that sort of thing. Now, distribution is all about psychological connections. If you want your social, message, social media messages to reach a wide audience, you not only have to have a large social network, you have to craft your messages in such a way that they make an emotional connection with those people so that they will retweet, reshare them, and reblog them. The pathways over which information now travels are built upon an intricate fabric of synapses, emotional connections, and biochemical triggers. It's a completely different media architecture. We just need to understand it. It is a massive, amorphous network. There's no editor-in-chief in charge dictating which content should go where at any given time. There's a billion autonomous actors deciding on what to do with each other's signals, and in the process, producing new messages, new pathways, new signals, and so forth. It's really difficult to visualize this system it's also really difficult to master it. Yet, some people have mastered this new system. It's just that if we were to choose which people we want to lead us as we are braving these new worlds, these people wouldn't necessarily be it. If the number of Twitter followers you have is the gauge of your power and influence in the world, then perhaps the most important person in the world right now is Katy Perry. She has 97 million Twitter followers. That's more than the population of Germany. Meanwhile, the rest of us congregate in these echo chambers of like-minded views. We share each other's opinions and confirm and reaffirm all these views, but we don't converse with those outside of our group. And as a result, we're not co-creating knowledge. But I do believe this platform can be a situation in which everyone gets a seat at the table, in which we, the majority, get to drown out power mongers like Nesta Kirchner. It can also be a very powerful driver of innovation. I like to think of social media as a giant global bazaar of ideas, each of them competing for our attention. The British author Matt Ridley likes to say that when ideas come together like this, they have sex and produce interesting new offspring. And we're actually seeing this now in the uh, open source software world where computer engineers, scientists, entrepreneurs are tapping this large global pool of brains to come up with new ideas and scientific breakthroughs at a pace we've never seen before. The biotech futurist Andrew Hessel formed something he called the Pink Army Cooperative, which is a global volunteer network of genetic engineers who are collaboratively codifying a new open source cure for breast cancer. Right? The possibilities are incredible here when we tap into this innovative pool. But the key is to figuring out 
how this information travels and changes and moves around in this really complex leaderless system. Where is the order in all this chaos? Well, it turns out that the best template we have for understanding things like this in a leaderless complex system is that of the most important leaderless complex system we have, nature itself. When Oliver Lucker and I looked at the seven biological laws, the basic biological laws of nature, that living things have a cellular structure, absorb nutrients, respond to stimuli, maintain homeostasis, grow, adapt, and evolve, we discovered there are some remarkable similarities with, with social media. In fact, these laws can show us how information grows, how networks expand, and how this online community that we're forming is behaving like a living organism, a social organism. Now, one of the key lessons that we took from this was that we must resist the temptation to censor content that we find distasteful. So we can think of our culture a little bit like the body's immune system, which needs to be confronted with harmful bacteria and viruses if it is to learn how to recognize them as a threat, develop antibodies, and then repel them, right? The same thing can be said for society. We need exposure to a full range of ideas, even really bad ones like you know, xenophobia and racism. In fact, I would say that if we are to block out the bigots, censor them, they'll just come back stronger, like those antibiotic-resistant superbugs. But it's really hard to resist this temptation to censor. This was evident last year during this huge Twitter fight between Leslie Jones, an African-American actor and comedian, and Milo Yiannopoulos, this alt-right provocateur. Jones was subjected to the most horrible torrent of abuse from 300,000 of Yiannopoulos' rabid supporters on Twitter. The language and the things that were said to her were so horrible that she quit Twitter that day with this message. Now, if you're like me, you too would be, have been left wondering what it means to be human in the wake of an episode like that. And you might also have applauded when Yiannopoulos was banned from Twitter because of this. But that act of censorship backfired. Shortly thereafter, a free Milo hashtag began trending. He became a martyr. Uh, a, a free speech cause celebre. He even got a $250,000 book deal from Simon & Schuster. It's as if sexism and racism had won the day. Now, if you're like me, this is really difficult to accept. So what are we supposed to do, those of us who want openness and tolerance and diversity in our online world so that we can build this huge pool of wonderful ideas? Do we just have to sit back passively and wait for culture to catch up? No. There are proactive things that we can do, in fact, we must do, to help build a healthier online culture. We need to learn how to use this interconnected emotional system to promote pro-social ideas around diversity and tolerance so that they can compete with their anti-social rivals in the marketplace of ideas. We need to build empathy machines. What do I mean by that? Well, let me close by telling you about my favorite social media site, one that means a lot to somebody who spends a great deal of time in the wonderful city of New York. Humans of New York is a Facebook page that's made of a compendium of photos of ordinary people, each accompanied by text in which the subject talks about their lives, loves, victories, failures, hopes, and fears. And each item is typically met by thousands of comments from people all around the world, complete strangers wishing that person goodwill and support. Honey, as it's known, has 18 million followers. That's what I mean by an empathy machine. Now, Brandon Stanton, the founder of Honey, is, is your kind of everyman hero. Why? Because he's not exactly the sort of person you'd expect to do this. He was formerly a bond trader on Wall Street. And when he lost his job in the financial crisis, that big dehumanizing global event, this is what he decided to do. Society needs to figure out how to absorb new ideas again and co-create knowledge 
It needs many more empathy builders like Brandon Stanton. So consider this an appeal to all of you. Each of us has a responsibility to be a humanist. We must be agents of change. We need to build empathy in our world, in the digital world, in social media. And the time to start doing that is now. Thank you.